Well, it's, it's been a, uh, a great day, quite diffuse in everything that we covered. And um, I mean, going all the way from our updates from the NCI, our, our challenges with regard to funding, prioritization, which is uh, very important, and platform to in implement precision medicine, all very interesting. And now we're here for panel discussion. And I think what I'd like to do is to start with our panel, and we have people from the cooperative groups, we have people from the NCI, FDA, and advocates. And I'd really like to start, and I'm going to ask Jim Dora show this first because I know he's given some thought to this, but I'm going to ask the others as well. The Fed's next, <laughs> but what should be the role of the cooperative groups? And uh, I think probably most people up here have thought about this. I'd like to hear first from, from Jim, and, and then we'll take it from there, and then Rick and, and from other leaders. So Jim, can you, what, what should be the role? Well, I, it, it seems to me that uh, if we have uh, done um, our job, all of us, to modernize uh, the system that we've all worked very hard to, to make uh, available to the public, um, then uh, the groups really are a uh, even more t than they've ever been and should be uh, the focus of our large-scale clinical trials enterprise at the NCI Sports. Um, uh, we don't really think that given the um, expertise required that you can write an R01 grant for a phase three trial anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, We have a network that I think um, as we move forward, we'll have every uh, ability to, uh, in a really a national sense, provide molecular medicine uh, expertise uh, at every level across the country. And so, um, you know, I, I, we may or may not have uh, uh, issues about whether or not uh, the, 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 this uh, NCTN should be doing primary registration trials uh, or not. Um, but I think that so many of the advances in uh, cancer uh, medicine and clinical uh, trials research have been multidisciplinary in nature. Mm -hmm. There is simply no other way that I see, uh, short of having a, a network like this, that will understand how these multidisciplinary activities that are genetically and uh, driven and uh, driven by other other kinds of um, a correlates that we can measure in our tumors, uh, that those things simply will not get done without a system of this nature. So I think there is a, an ongoing, a critically important uh, set of roles uh, that primarily focuses on doing uh, scientifically driven uh, clinical trials. Thanks, Jim. Let me just follow up on that. We heard Mark Sabatine's talk earlier today, and he described uh, the Timmy Group as an ARO, Academic Research Organization. And I heard him say at one point, and I don't know if Mark is here still, uh, but I heard Mark say, well, the NHLBI is good for strategies using old drugs, and the, uh, the ARO is good for new drugs. Can you just follow up your comments, Jim, with um, do you think there is a sp more specific strategy that fits for our cooperative groups, or do you think we span the spectrum, obviously? Is a bit different from what what Mark talked about our structure. Well, I think it's I think it's actually uh, quite different um, because uh, the science is different. Where we are with the science is different, mm -hmm. um, and also because uh, I don't think that uh, it will ever be the case that pharma will, with any new drug, do the uh, as broad a drug development plan across the kinds of tumors that um, that, that we're capable of doing. Uh, it's just not in their, uh, at least not that I've observed over the last decade, it's not in either their, their business model um, uh, to do those kinds of things. And so if you look time and again, time and again, pre-biomarker era, post-biomarker era, uh, there are uh, studies that the, um, our, our networks, both early and, and late, are capable of doing that will find uh, scientific reasons uh, to bring a drug to a particular disease that nobody's ever thought to do, mm -hmm. whether it's endometrial cancer uh, or salivary gland cancer, um, or even the subsetting of, uh, of, uh, of lung cancers that are getting uh, more and more subsegmented. So uh, I think actually the opportunities uh, for, the, for the network going forward are actually greater than they've ever been. Okay. 
Thanks, Jim. Rick, FDA, Hemonk, will you take I, a shot at this? Could I try to answer the question that you just posed? Mm -hmm. and, and here again, I don't think industry is at this table in a sense. And one of the issues is control of the drug mm -hmm. and especially control of a new molecular entity that people have to realize uh, that comes into play of where a clinical trial is done. Uh, if one is taking a look at a registration trial, there's an intense amount of pressure to get that drug approved and approved in a very timely fashion. And hence, I think most of the pharmaceutical firms take a look that they have to have control of that. Mm -hmm. And when you took a look at the Timmy studies that were being done, the group was actually working as a, co as a, as a CRO, so to speak. Okay, the pharmaceutical firms had control. They were writing that right. check out. They were mm -hmm. dictating. Their, their CRO was going out to take a look and audit the site. So, so they had control of that. And I think that is a, a very important thing that you know, we realize. But, but to answer your question, uh, I, I think there are fundamental questions. And the things that come into play are the things that are wrong with the title of this conference, implementing a national cancer clinical trial system, okay? And let me address what I mean by that. Uh, one has to realize that there have been tremendous changes in the clinical trial structure and the, and the delivery of therapy, oncological therapies uh, from when the uh, cooperative groups were formed in the late 1960s, 70s, et cetera. And they focus on two, I think, very important issues, the role of international trials. All of the trials that come to the FDA at the present time are international trials. I don't care if you're talking about single arm trials in rare diseases, even single arm trials in common diseases. Uh, and not to have a international perspective uh, is really uh, probably inappropriate at this time. And I think really for the cooperative groups to be relevant for the next decade or so, they're really going to have to address the issue of how they play into not the national cancer trial system, but the international cancer trial system, because we are an international uh, body of doing clinical trials. And that is going to become ever more important as we take a look at rarer and rarer subsets of diseases. Mm -hmm. And the, the pharmaceutical firms have already realized this. Mm -hmm. They are not doing only trials here done in the United States. They are doing them internationally. The, the other issue that I have a problem here is the clinical trial system. A system it has multiple components to it. And here again, the piece that is missing from this entire discussion is the pharmaceutical firms, okay? How do they interact with the cooperative groups and how should they act, interact with the cooperative groups? Uh, as I stated before, they have different motives and they may not be in tune, so to speak, with the whole picture of how cancer development should be going. For example, do we need numerous uh, pharmaceutical firms working on the same target, having multiple, all of the, all of the pharmaceutical firms working on anti-PD-1 uh, therapies at the present time. Mm -hmm. is, is that in the best interest of looking at a, a clinical trial system in the United States? So I, I think, you know, the question that you posed is, is a, a interesting one. And, and what trial should the cooperative groups be doing? Well, they probably should be doing trials that are different from what the industry is doing. Um, and, and here again, just to duplicate a trial that's done and can be done by the, the, uh, by, by the industry, I don't think it is really the, utilizing the resources and the publicly funded resources that we have available here. I don't know exactly what those trials should be. Should they be comparative trials looking at different agents? Uh, should they be looking at more molecularly based uh, drugs? But simply adding you know, a drug to another drug and comparing it to uh, you know, the standard therapy probably isn't uh, of any interest uh, and really isn't utilizing the, um, the, the resources. And here again, they're publicly funded uh, resources that have come to play. But I, I really think, you know, the, the two issues here is the role of the cooperative groups in an international clinical trial uh, system, and, and also the system of how do we interact with the, uh, 
with the uh, pharmaceutical industry really needs to be uh, analyzed and looked at. Great, thanks, Rick. I'm going to ask our advocates to speak next, Jim. I just want to ask you quickly to to uh, to Rick's point. Do we have a member of the of the FDA on the on the CTAC Strategic Planning Committee or a member of Rick's group? I'm just asking, Jim. And CAB. Um, so, yes. Good. Okay. Great. Monica? I, I just also want to put in a plug for tomorrow because during tomorrow's session, we will be addressing both of you, basically all of your concerns. We have a session on partnerships um, that are required to, to move the field forward, for which we will both see uh, involvement of international trials and international members as well as our pharmaceutical partners. Great. Nancy, do you want to speak uh, first and then Pat? Um, this has been really interesting because when I got involved with cancer, um, th that was 1996, and things have changed dramatically since then, obviously. One of the things that struck me then and still strikes me is that I think most people in the community look at cancer treatment as being something like what Rich described. You know, we think that, you know, you take my tumor and you send it off to the bank and, and they figure out and they give me exactly the treatment I need. And it's nice to see things starting to go in that direction. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who are newly diagnosed and they say, well, they're going to tell me what's going to cure my cancer. I'm like, well, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. I think some of the things where I think the cooperative groups could do a lot more than industry is, not first of all, in the realm of data sharing with all the information that we're getting out there. Um, industry is starting to do more data sharing, but I think the groups could make quite a bit of the data more public and allow us to learn from each other. There are um, strengths to using the groups with, you know, it's a lot easier to run a multi-center trial as a cooperative group than as a CRO. And I've heard multiple um, explanations of that in a variety of meetings. I think industry gets a lot more rigid about checking boxes. So I think that there are reasons for companies to work with NCI in different ways than they'll be trying to get things to market. But I think the overriding message that came to me today is that um, the integration of cancer research with clinical care is fundamental to making all of this work because as we segment down um, the population of patients out there, you have to screen a thousand patients to find the one person who may benefit. You can't do that in an environment where, I mean, you all know what I mean, right? I, it just, the system isn't set up. And I do think that I see more and more patients going out with their tumor and saying, okay, sequence it, now take it to the doctor. And we need to work with that because otherwise I think the groups will become irrelevant. People will start taking their tumor to their doctor. The doctor's going to say, why should, I, why should I do a trial? I can just give you the drug. So. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Pat. I thought it was interesting that in the last session, Dr. Garraway's comment that it's humbling how much we don't know. Um, I knew I didn't know a lot when I came in here today, but I didn't expect that you people didn't know a lot. And I found <laughs> it very interesting that you would invite me here and, and ask for my opinion, because one of the things that, that I thought of when I first got involved in, in cancer research patient advocacy is how do I keep from getting in the way of the cancer researchers and the clinician as they're trying to treat my disease? And that, that was a very, very large concern for me. Now, the cancer cooperative groups, as, as I look at, at what they do, is they have to help keep everything we do focused on the cancer patient. And I, I think they have the ability to, to do that. There's a lot of interesting science out there that we talked about today along the, the way, but it, we have to keep what we're, we're working on focused on that patient. How do we cure their disease? How do we uh, make their quality of, of life better? And is what we're looking at going to benefit them? Great. Chuck? So I'm a simple man, and I guess I'm thinking in a more simple way, although it is a bit of a variant of what both uh, Rick and Bob said earlier. I think the cooperative groups very simply have to do the research that no one else can or will do. In the old days, it was the large-scale adjuvant phase three trials that needed 25,000 patients. 
but now I think it's either the trials that aren't lucrative, serafinib versus serafinib plus um, Adria, or sorry, Adria, but sorry, Adria, serafinib and hepatocellular carcinoma. The trials they can't find patients for in industry, so rare diseases or subsets even of common diseases like we heard about today. Harnessing multiple drug companies to work together I think is not going to come from industry uh, voluntarily. Harnessing our basic scientists in drug development as we just heard about and probably um, equally important multidisciplinary or multimodality trials. Great. Okay. Bob? Well, I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier today, I mean, we are very closely integrated with the cancer centers and the spores and the UO1 programs. So, I mean, I, I, I view the groups as an extension of those programs to, to actually give voice to some of their pilot work and uh, to help us bring it into a, multi, a, a broader framework, a multi-center, multinational framework to really test it in large phase two studies or ultimately bring it to phase three. I, I don't think we should be pigeonholed into rare tumors. Uh, I would much rather be pigeonholed to a, a rare biologic process, but not necessarily rare tumors. And I think that, I think that we, we can be on the forefront of integrating biology into our studies, and we're actually doing that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have CKIT studies that cross various diseases. We have multiple studies that cross diseases. So I think we have that platform. And the other thing, too, is that uh, you know, although the idea of companion diagnostics was a great idea 10 years ago, I think it's really holding the field back now uh, in the sense that, you know, we know that there are mutations in BRAF that aren't picked up by the companion diagnostic test. We need to be able to have a broad-based approach to the biology of these cancers and to be in a position where, you know, okay, we may not be doing a registration trial, but we might be leading the way towards what the FDA, the payer community, the research community needs to do in order to do cutting edge research. So uh, I think that the role of the groups is uh, probably more important now than it ever was. And I ha I I'm not embarrassed by the fact that we have over the last 10 or 15 years come up with, I think, 30 different uh, indications that have uh, provided opportunities for cancer patients that they never had before, even if it's an A versus B trial. Some of them have uh, bigger deltas than uh, some of the studies that were done by industry. So I, I think this country is a, you know, we're the, we're the last socialist bastion in this country. This is a, this is a capitalist country. And I don't have a, such a Manichaean view of what the publicly funded system should do and what the privately funded system should do. The best thing for patients is what, what we should do. I don't think it should be Manichaean. Peter. Well, it's a tough, tough comment to follow, Bob, but uh, <laughs> so, so childhood cancer shares uh, a number of the same challenges and, and opportunities, I think, as, uh, as my colleagues in medical oncology, but there's some, some distinct differences um, that we are fortunate uh, uh, to have. Um, I think the role for the children's oncology group uh, should be to prioritize what the important questions are. Uh, Industry, we absolutely want to partner with, um, but industry will uh, always take a very drug-centric view. Um, their goal, of course, is to develop new drugs um, for rare and ultra-rare diseases, and that's all of childhood cancer. We do studies where the incidence in this country is less than 100 children a year. We conduct those studies. Um, we have to be the ones, uh, and by we, the COG, uh, is multidisciplinary, includes uh, parent patient advocates and specialists from throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the field, we need to be able to decide what is the most, uh, what is the highest priority at any given time, because otherwise we're, we're going to run out of patients. I, I would say, however, that um, the return on investment uh, from the NCI funding uh, the cooperative group system and certainly the COG is is quite remarkable. Um, people know, and Rick, it actually began in the, in the 50s with the cooperative groups, but uh, less than 10 percent five-year vent-free survival overall, now more than 80 percent of vent-free survival. That was done entirely with NCI resources. There was nothing other than NCI resources, and that's, that's a real feather, I think, in NCI's cap, that they were able to uh, take the long view and, and, and support that. Because we've grown up with more than 50 years of cooperative group research, um, the culture in pediatric oncology is one of, of research. 
More than 90% of children in the U.S. are treated at COG sites. Uh, somewhere between 50 to 60% uh, are enrolled on, on COG trials. With all that said, childhood cancer still remains a leading cause of death uh, from disease in uh, children older than, older than one. And almost half our children have uh, late effects uh, uh, as part of survivorship. So the work is just really beginning. The opportunities are there. The partnerships are there. But I don't think there's any other entity other than the cooperative group that can ultimately act, as Bob said, hand-in-hand uh, hand with both uh, patients, parents, and families, as well as industry in, in setting the priorities. Thank you, Wally. So I'll just make a few comments related to uh, energy oncology. Uh, that's our pseudo acronym for the merger of RTOG, GOG, NSABP. It is not pronounced NRG, it's energy. And we had our first energy meeting with over 2,000 people at it uh, just a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, it's an exciting uh, group, uh, semi manageable. Uh, at this point. And, uh, you know, when you look at what our, our vision is, and our vision is to use all the tools and resources available in modern clinical and translational research to improve the outcome of many types of patients with localized and locally advanced disease, there just isn't another North American platform that's going to work across gynecologic cancer, central nervous system tumors, head, neck, uh, localized, uh, locally advanced prostate cancer. So if uh, energy oncology was taken off on a love boat uh, into a new dimension, uh, those patients would not have a infrastructure where a very talented group of diverse investigators were asking questions, some of which relate to uh, new genomics and new science, and some of which relate to optimizing the integration of surgery imaging, radiation oncology, and existing drugs. So uh, to, to think of a world without a group like that would really be, I think, a loss for the hundreds of thousands of cancer patients that uh, could potentially be benefited from advances. Uh, that being said, when you pile a whole bunch of uh, investigators into a group like that, to be successful, you need resources. and. Uh, you know, what, what our responsibility is, is to not just continue to cut and paste uh, trials when there isn't a pertinent question. I mean, I think we have a responsibility to look at what we've done in portfolio management in the past and see where the advances in new trials can really be more than just incremental. And I think all of us on this panel and elsewhere really have that responsibility, probably even more in terms of stewarding both federal and non-federal resources in that. Well, just following up on that, uh, in light of the fact that there are uh, fewer groups, there are more people per group, uh, there are, as we know, restricted budget at this time, the young people coming up, uh, the trainees the, uh, that all of us, likely the majority of people in this room, had the opportunity to either head a trial, co-lead co a trial, lead correlative science of a trial, and how important that is for our academic advancement and, and frankly, staying in the field to replace us at this table and this podium. Right. What are your concerns? I'd like to hear from the four of you. What are, what are your concerns um, and how have you thought about solving that? Are there some ideas, collective ideas that we can all embark on to, to keep people involved and motivated and inspired to continue along the path of clinical research? So I'll say something and then uh, let the others say it. But uh, I think we have to be much more um, self-conscious about that than we were in the past. In the past, uh, there was sort of the classic uh, mentorship and apprenticeship that would happen. Knowing uh, that we're all at a very crowded table in our integrated groups, uh, you know, in, in, in our group, we've set up a uh, mentorship process, uh, which is at every committee level and at the group level with uh, pilot grants and so forth. I'm not sure it's going to be enough. I think we're really going to have to look even more broadly. Uh, there are generational differences, I think, in how much uh, pain and suffering and patients, uh, people born in certain decades have versus others. Some of us don't know any better and just keep doing it, but others are smarter. <laughs> and uh, so so I think it's, it's something we really need to think about, and, and it's something that even uh, 
at the uh, Coalition of National Cooperative Groups might be something to really think about on a more unified basis. Peter? So we've had a young investigator, investigator committee since our outset, but I think the real challenge is one that the, the new network has not addressed. And the real concern I have for young investigators is um, the clinical trial system is still designed to fail late. Um, throughout all this reorganization, we haven't addressed the ability for an idea to fail early. So now it comes through the cooperative group, it goes through the steering committee, it ultimately moves up, and it can still die. And the, I think the most disheartening thing for a young investigator is to invest one, two, or two years of their career in an idea that's going to fail. And where I think we need to go to is a system where we can uh, fail early. I mean, that David Diltz, a lot of his work, um, spoke about that. But the NCTN, as far as I can see, hasn't addressed it. It's addressed a lot of things, but it hasn't addressed the idea that you're going to get a thumbs up with everyone who has a role in deciding that an idea has merit and should move forward or an idea does not have significant merit and should not move forward. If we don't solve that, it's going to be hard to sit across from a table from any young investigator and tell them why they should be involved. It's one thing to invest four, five, six months of, of an academic career and have an idea die. It's very different to do it for two plus years uh, and then go back to the drawing board. Right. Yeah, we might take a lesson from industry where fail early, fail cheaply. Uh, Bob. Well, in uh, ECOG, and, and actually in ECOG Akron, we've, uh, through the years, uh, at least I'll, I'll speak for ECOG, uh, the, designed a number of programs to try to attract uh, people in the early fellowship through uh, a fellowship award, people uh, just out of their fellowship through the Carbone Award, and then what we call the Young Investigator Award. So we have had this approach, and in fact, if you look at the Young Investigator Award over the last 15 years or so, 11 of those people have ended up in very senior positions in the group. So we, we've had the, these uh, purposeful programs, and they've all been funded by uh, our foundation. Uh, none of it's been funded by uh, the government. Um, but I do think, and we did put into this grant, that, that we need to do more, as Wally said. So we are you know, uh, going to charge uh, Joe Sperano and, and uh, Bruce Giantonio, uh, one of our associate chairs and executive officers, with, with developing a, member, uh, a mentorship committee and to really formalize that program. Because you know, we do have, each committee chair is, is paying attention to bring up the young investigators, and, uh, but I don't think that, that it's enough. And so uh, we're actually going to uh, formalize that program. Okay. Chuck. So similar to ECOG, SWAG also um, awards and funds young investigators with some specific um, money set aside. We also have a young investigator course where a large a number of the young investigators are actually flown to Seattle and lectured to by the best of SWAG. Mm -hmm. And they're basically, they come up with a protocol before they leave. And so they get the sort of teaching and sense of excitement whether or not it actually comes to fruition. And actually a large percentage of them actually do move forward. We also are going to be starting formal mentorship so that even if they're not running the protocol, say a mid-level investigator is running the protocol, there will be an associated young person with each of those studies. And finally, um, we are also instituting term limits to allow more leadership opportunities and creating more leadership spots in terms of subcommittees. I think they have to have a sense that not only can they run trials, but they can engage in the governance and scientific direction of the group as well. Great. Thanks. Yes. Can I, I'd just like to add to that. I think that we also need to make sure in terms of younger investigators that in an academic setting, um, reward, collaboration and hard work is rewarded as opposed to authorship of a paper. And specifically, um, Rob Califf did an analysis of clinicaltrials.gov that was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And it showed that most of the trials in clinicaltrials.gov were small, single institution phase two trials, which they aren't really going to add that much to the output. And um, I was struck by the presentation this morning where there were a lot of phase three trials that were active in, in the national network that actually might have a difference on health outcomes, on public policy, and on how patients are treated. So I think that that kind of alignment of incentives and evaluation and rewards really needs to be looked at, not just from cancer, but at academic centers, too. 
Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that uh, at, at the academic institutions, you know, the ability to convince department chairs and deans uh, to uh, be more tolerable of, of the extramural situation and clinical research to promote in a timely, uh, realistic fashion for accomplishments that for accomplishments that aren't traditionally measured has been a challenge. I know we've we've heard a. Uh, uh, the NCI has been a, a powerful advocate of that. We've we've used that at our own institution, but I think we need to come together, maybe to set some new rules in these changing times about what it is that we regard as worthy of promotion, because that's ultimately what what keeps many of our young investigators in the game. One of the other questions, if anybody has questions, can come up to the to the microphone. One other question I wanted to ask, and I'll start with Jim, but anyone else who has a comment, you know, Jim, we've seen just from your summary today extraordinary progress um, in redesigning what everyone hopes and I believe will be a more streamlined, more efficient, more collaborative process. And we also know that you're under incredible pressure financially uh, to do things in a different way. I just wonder if you can comment as we've redesigned things, what do you think um, are the opportunities that may be missed, that maybe we all can be thinking about um, to see that we don't miss them? But in, in this climate, are there things that we're just not going to be able to do that we'd like to do? And um, maybe that we can leave this meeting with some creative juices about how to accomplish those anyway. So I don't know if I would put it exactly that way, but we did a lot of thinking about redesigning our phase one program. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I need to give credit where credit is due. I really, it started with comments that Bill Height made. And uh, he's certainly someone who knows uh, all the sides of uh, academic medicine um, and also the pharmaceutical industry. And he said a, a very profound thing. He said, you know, um, uh, even J and J, with all of its budget, uh, doesn't have access to the kind of cancer biology that the NCI supports. And if you're going to change your system, uh, change it in a way that allows you to optimally utilize all the various ways that you support tumor biology and help to bring that to the clinic. And the redesign of the Phase One program now specifically does that. Right. And so if and and I think we learned a lot in trying to do that. And so if there are changes that continue to need to be made, and there will be, and that's the point of having uh, uh, you know, Bob and, and George talk about these things, but are there ways to continue to facilitate the utilization of all the different ways that we support research? Um, not to make it harder, but to make it easier for the groups to use your um, Ohio State's uh, uh, core facilities or, or, or somebody else's uh, SPORE uh, core facilities. Uh, not to have the, all of those things, which are considerable um, in their aggregate, um, siloed and not available to every member of the NCI-supported research uh, community. Thank you. I'll stop there and just take a question. That's Steve over there. Steve Please. Grubbs from uh, Delaware. So I want to put another topic out and just see how you all feel about that. And we've kind of uh, alluded that today with Ward and Steve Clouser talking about in the NCORP how we want to start looking at costs of care delivery. So my question for you all, and I'd particularly for Nancy and Patrick to look at this, do we have a role in the cooperative groups and the NCI and the FDA to begin to put value on our scientific discoveries? And, you know, I've lived through the era where in the 1990s we were appalled at $100,000 for a bone marrow transplant. Well, we've blown through that with the common drugs we're given every day of the week now. So my question for all of us, I don't want to put anything on our plate. We're geared up for scientific discovery and improvement and survival and whatever. But do we have to, at some point in time, as investigators begin to look at the value of what we're discovering? Because it's clear that we're not going to be able to continue to afford all these new discoveries we've had. So that's a question for you all I'd like to hear. What's our role in that, if there's any at all? Who wants to start? I'll, I'll sure. take a shot at it. And, I, and, you know, that's something that as a cancer patient, uh, I hear about all the time as I, I work with new cancer patients. That one of the comments they make to me quite often is, I don't want to bankrupt my family while I chase a miracle that probably won't happen. And I think we have some of the same issues that, that we're facing in, in cancer research. And I appreciated your comments this morning, Dr. Grubb, about that cancer care delivery studies. You know, once we have it, what are we going to do with it, I guess would be one question. And are there less expensive ways of, of getting it? 
whenever we build something new, uh, there, or whenever we restructure something, there's always a, a tendency to want to build some new things in, and I, I don't think that's always bad, but in the process of doing that, I think we have to make sure that we continue to fund our core functions adequately. And, and to make sure we do that, I think we need to put the measurements in that you uh, talk about in your questions. We have to be able to evaluate those things. In the, oh, yeah. Um, you know, the best way to uh, have uh, cost-effective cancer care is to have evidence-based cancer care. And the best way to do that is to have randomized studies above and beyond the first indication for a therapy. So uh, we can think of lots of examples, including high-dose therapy and bone marrow transplant for breast cancer, where it was randomized trials that uh, spoke against the toxicity and spoke about the lack of benefit. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, therapies that have been tested that were being used off study, where randomized trials <clears throat> in the cooperative groups showed the lack of benefit, and they were abandoned, which I think led to cost effectiveness and lower toxicity. So uh, beyond that, I think with comparative effectiveness research and some of the groups being involved in that, we're going to see some of the tools of health economists being employed in cooperative group trials, and I think every group welcomes that. Other comments? Yes. Um, we're, as Bob said, we're a capitalist country. You know, Congress is going to have to get involved in anything that would change the pricing, the way pricing is done. I think what Len Saltz and Peter Bach did at Sloan Kettering with Eflucrocept is a really good example of what can be done. But even that didn't, you know, that was messy, you know. So I don't know. Okay, if there are no other comments, yes. You have a yeah. I'm Lee Jennings. I'm a retired surgical oncologist and a member of the Colorado Cancer Research CCOP Board of Directors and IRB. We are one of the original CCOPs in the nation and formed in 1984. And this was by a small group of doctors in one hospital with two uh, cooperating hospitals. We've grown to 17 institutions in Colorado with 125 uh, participating uh, community-based uh, oncologists. And over the years, this coalition has, uh, of cancer specialists has been able to uh, get rid of the uh, competitiveness and has produced cooperation within the community. This grassroots model has been very effective for us. Now, the question uh, that I have for you is that the NCORP focus on institutions has been of some concern to us, and we're wondering if we will be able to participate in that, since it uh, seems to focus on institutions. As a specialist, cancer specialist with 30 years with the uh, community oncology CC CCOP, I leave you with two questions. How do you plan to incorporate existing freestanding CCOP organizations that are highly successful but not institution based? And the second question is I heard something today, I think, about online public comment. Uh, does anyone have an answer for whether that will happen? Or do you want to? Word should yes, should answer this because because the first question the first question has been answered and it's not just institution based, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yes, that's that's correct. It's it's not just institutions. I think I'm not. Perhaps the reference to that was that in the uh, NCCP it was only hospital institutions, but no, it has been very clear that uh, it, the the what we're doing is encouraging multi uh, institution. Uh, participation in this partnership so that we think will be strong or strengthening both for clinical trials and for cancer care delivery. Uh, but all of the practices, all the permutations of, hosp of uh, types of practices, hospitals, practices, combinations are, uh, will be eligible for this program. What was the other question? Uh, I think it was related to public commentary. 
Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we had previously uh, talked about public comment. We are in the process and have been actually uh, since I think about June. Um, uh, do working with stakeholders in areas of uh, clinical trials, the research bases, the the sites, all of the uh, CCOP sites are being interviewed for at least an hour uh, to get their input. Um, and uh, we have encouraged uh, comments and, and uh, communications to us at the NCI. Okay. Steve, did you have a question? Yep, please. Thank you, Steve Cantadosi, Cedar Sinai. I have a comment and a question about the earlier remark regarding um, failing early. Um, the, the comment is that we're perfectly free to construct our developmental pipeline to have a bias toward either early failure or late failure. And it seems to me that there's uh, quite a lot of uh, split thinking about this point right now. For example, I think the historic oncology pipeline has, has been somewhat biased toward late failure perhaps, and that actually may not have been appropriate in an era when there weren't very many therapeutic alternatives, um, or maybe it was. I think it, it depends a lot on the disease. If you look outside cancer in some areas where there aren't good therapeutic alternatives, degenerative neurologic disease is a great example. The pipelines that are being discussed in that community right now tend to be late failure. That is, they push many things forward into comparative testing, uh, push dose finding very late in development, try to get things into randomized comparative trials as much as they can, fail late. But it's appropriate because they don't have many alternatives. The problem that I see with, with the cancer pipeline is that we're now in an era where there's such strongly um, motivated and supported science behind the therapeutics that we probably don't want many of them to fail early. And there have been some examples discussed today where that might have been inappropriate. So some of these targeted therapies with low toxicity actually are better suited to a late failure kind of pipeline. Uh, on the other hand, the armamentarium that currently exists would suggest that we should have an early failure pipeline. And if you look at the industry pipeline, that's probably the kind of thinking. It's very expensive for them to fail late. They don't want to get in the marketplace with a weak product and so on. So given that there are these different strategies and in the current uh, state of therapeutics and the current science that we're all looking at with targeted agents, what do panel members think about what's the appropriate uh, characteristic of the pipeline that we should be working under and then how are we going to encourage the cooperative groups in particular to have those, those sorts of biases in their developmental pipeline? Rick, do you want to take a shot at that or? <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe I'll, I'll clarify uh, my point because, again, I, I was not talking from a drug-centric development pipeline. I'm talking about what the cooperative groups do. The cooperative groups currently do predominantly phase three and phase three some phase two studies. The problem there is, is that an idea for a phase three study can take a couple of years plus to develop. There's not a lot more information that emerges over those two years. It's basically people thinking it's a good idea or not a good idea. It's not science driven, it's opinion driven. Um, and, and, and that's where you need to get the stakeholders opinion as far as thumbs up or thumbs down um, because I think it's very different from early for early drug development where it is a big argument do you want to fail early or fail late. Here is we have the science in hand. It just takes forever to get it through the system. Let's get an early decision on whether people think this phase three idea has merit or not. And in a very minor addition, I have to circle back to the young investigator talk we had earlier. It seems that particularly devastating for our young folks to get a protocol fired on the line and have it fail at the last minute, uh, much right. worse than for the rest of us. Absolutely. Yeah, it seems to me that in more recent years in the cooperative group, I've, I've seen um, more early closure of trials in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good and robust way from the right, right groups of people. But that's a very late failure, right? If you let the study open and not finish, that's the latest possible failure. Oh, failure absolutely, you but probably important from, as opposed to continuing it. <laughs> One of the things, I, I wear a lot of different hats, and one of the hats I wear is I'm on the Cohen Task Force, which 
is under the GI steering committee, which is one of the scientific steering committees. And we really urge people to bring concepts forward as soon as possible so that they can get discussed by the group. And there have been a couple times where things have come forward and people said, oh, ugh, don't want it, you know, and that's early failure. Um, there, different cooperative groups do that differently. And I've, I heard, I don't remember which group it was, but there was one guy who had worked on a, on a concept idea and wanted to bring it forward, but the group wouldn't let him bring it forward until it was much more refined. And we ended up, the task force, we did, we do anonymous surveys and it was voted down and he was very frustrated and I think that's the kind of thing. So I think the sooner you get things out there and let them get vetted by the community, you know, will you all pitch in? I think that's really important. Steve, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to add one, one more remark and that is about um, the basis for an early failure. Uh, and I'm not talking now about administrative failure, but, but one based on science. The current pipeline really looks at animal studies, dosing, safety and activity, followed by efficacy. And if we want to fail early, the most reliable way to fail early would be based on efficacy, which means that we would have to address that question much, much earlier in the developmental pipeline. And that would be turning things on its head, potentially. And, uh, and finally, I'd also point out that if you do that, early means weaker evidence. And are we prepared to make developmental decisions based on weaker evidence than we, than we use currently? I mean, these are very serious issues, I think, in, in what finally comes through the pipeline. I'd just be interested in what people think about it. Yeah, excellent point. Rick, you're ready. Well, I'm going to leave on a very optimistic note because I've seen all that is coming through over the past couple of years. I am very much more impressed by the quality of drugs and drug applications that are coming to us. And, and I, I think people have to realize that there are, is, over the past couple of years, um, really, I, I think, better drugs that are being developed and a better understanding of the diseases. And you could even see that by uh, the drop in ODAC meetings, for example. We don't need the ODAC to tell us that a drug that has a 60% response rate or an 80% response rate deserves to be uh, approved. So I, I think perhaps, you know, the question of early failure, late failure might actually be and hopefully be addressed by better drugs. Um, and here again, um, you know, should a drug that has a very marginal response rate be taken forward uh, when one has drugs that have better response rates, impressive response rates? So I, I would hope that, and here again, ending on an optimistic point, we're moving away from those marginal drugs and really to, um, you know, drugs that uh, really are going to make a big difference. You know, I, I stated to uh, an interviewer that, um, I was talking to, we, we generally used to have arguments inside the agency whether or not the drug should be approved. Now we're having an argument of how fast the drug should be approved, which is a real sea change, okay? Yes. And here again, I, I think there is a difference in the quality of drugs. We're moving away from those general cytotoxic drugs where we had a roulette wheel. Let's see if we should uh, develop the drug in colon cancer, breast cancer, whatever, based on one response rate or a one response uh, out of 14 patients to drugs that have uh, out of 20, 25 patients, half of those patients responding. So hopefully these questions will be mitigated by better drugs. Just um, asked another question. Um, we heard from David and Levi and Vince about, you know, the um, precision medicine and the need for for tissue, even though it's small amounts of tissue, sometimes it's just a couple unstained slides. I'd be interested to know what are people, what are our, our cooperative group chairs doing to ensure that um, we can get as many patients accrued to trials as is possible um, with acquisition of tissue? Um, what strategies are you, when we, when we know, despite a huge increase, a 100% increase in funding for clinical trials, there still may not be enough to do the tissue sampling um, do we have trials now that require tissue to enroll, uh, which used not to be the case, and, and, and how are we 
working with institutions and CCOPs to, to pay for that. Anybody want to take a shot at that? What's, what's going on? So, so uh, Mike, uh, there are more and more trials that require tissue for uh, eligibility. Right. And there's more integral markers uh, that have to be tissue-based or in some way uh, biomarker-based. So uh, with that comes uh, some amount of tissue. There's uh, more and more clarity about uh, their use and their availability to investigators after their the primary analysis within the study are done and they're they're available. Uh, but it's uh, it's still a, a work in progress uh, for those trials where it is not while well, it's uh, mandated but not required for registration. Mm -hmm. It's not a hundred percent, but it's it's at a higher level. Uh, but again, uh, our institutions, our investigators, whether they're at pra private practice, academic, and CCOPs, their staff is stretched, and uh, they do the things they're required to do mm -hmm. for a trial, uh, not, uh, not elective. So the more we make, uh, make it uh, available to them, the more our tumor banks uh, provide them kits that allow their staff to do it more readily, the better. But uh, it's a challenge, but I think it's improving. We have outstanding biobanks uh, that have far more than tissue now, have lots of urine, serum, and, and lots of In general, of are hospitals willing to pick up the cost, the ancillary costs associated with this, or in general, they're not? Is it, what's your experience? Uh, well, I you think know, the needle biopsies you know, that need to be done. The hospitals probably don't know what they're picking up or not picking up. It's probably the uh, truthful like answer. Well. Scratch the record there. <laughs> Peter, and then Chuck. So the majority of our studies, um, we obtain tissue, and in large measure, uh, our success has come because we, we uh, have enough information now to make evidence-based decisions as far as uh, which trials a patient might be eligible for, high risk, intermediate risk, and, and so forth. So we have a spectrum of biology studies that are all linked actually not to a single study, but usually to a portfolio of studies in a, in a given disease. What we're moving towards, however, um, because of limitations on uh, biopsying in, uh, children when there's no potential for, for benefit, is to try to capture every child in North, in North America um, at diagnosis uh, to submit tissue, mm -hmm. whether or not they're eligible uh, for a study. We recognize that there's going to be some challenges there because um, a subpopulation may be missed at time of relapse. Uh, there may be a change in that uh, profile. But uh, as a starting place, we want to try to capture um, all the children in, in the country uh, to get the biology on them at diagnosis. So where the biopsy is being done, you're maybe getting an extra piece uh, that the hospitals that know they're paying for, and you're getting that sent to your bank. Well, they actually, and... the hospitals do know, and we are asked, and we say we have no money. Okay. Um, so then it's That's what I'm kind of getting at. How's this happening? Right. Chuck, did you have a comment? Uh, just this is a real culture change. I mean, 10 years ago, if you had a mandated biopsy, the IRB would have said absolutely not. Right. Now our just patients are not only asking for biopsies uh, when they go on trial, they want it when they progress, they want right. it second progression and third. But the other thing is we really are trying to create this culture of science and biologically driven trials within our groups. So in SWAG, merely by doing that, we've been able to collect uh, specimens on 86% of our trials that even just requested them, did not require them. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's been our experience as well in, in ECOG, I think, uh, you know, so uh, about 90% of people uh, consent to have uh, their tissue uh, stored. So it's, it's really, and most of our patients uh, actually do. So, I mean, we have, you know, I think we all have huge banks of tissue and tremendous opportunities uh, uh, to use our annotated specimens. And I think the other important thing relative to biomarkers, although it's not labs, is now, you know, we have the imagers totally integrated into the system now so that we can not only follow the biology in the laboratory but also follow functional imaging uh, both in ECOG Akron and also with the IROC the new program uh, uh, in the in the network so I mean I think that we're all positioned really uh, to be very strong in the biomarker arena both in the lab uh, and and in uh, the functional imaging area okay great Chuck or I'm sorry uh, I Pat uh, just speaking as a person probably that's the best producer of cancerous tissue on the, on the panel, I, I would like to say <laughs> that uh, uh, all you really have to do to get my tissue is ask for it. 
you know, I would hope that we would not be doing unneeded uh, tissue collection after the fact, but if, if you're taking out my tumor anyway, you can have it, you can put the G gene sequence on the side of a semi truck or whatever you want to do with it, if it's going to help cure cancer. Thanks. One, can I just add quickly, one new wrinkle though is that, again, wearing my colon task force hat, we've been looking at something that would involve rebiopsy of metastatic disease. So not the primary tumor, but a reop, an FNA. And there was universal agreement in the room that those biopsies would not be paid for by the hospital or by providers, and we'd have to figure out a mechanism. So I'm here, I guess, on behalf of all of them, Jim, to say I hope NCI is thinking about funding for biopsies. Thanks, Nancy. Sir. My question about public comment had more to do with whether there was a plan to actively seek public comment as opposed to just being willing to receive it. I, I don't think there's going to be a, a web uh, public comment um, because of the timing at this point. Um, but I think what has happened in the process is that the uh, the planning and the development, the funding issues, the, the important issues to put into the concept uh, have taken a lot of time. Um, so I think we'll have to convene to see if there will be a period for the, a similar type of public comment that I think was available for the uh, group uh, transformation. But the activities in this time have not led us to the point where we were uh, uh, able to disclose information because we, we went, we hadn't gotten the planning. I mean, there are still some critical issues that need to be addressed before we put, um, put the information out for public comment. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I was intrigued this morning by the trial that was called the Alchemist. I, I thought it was a cool name. Um, but the idea being that tissue is going to be collected on patients with early lung cancer, and that's going to be used to then place patients on specific trials. So seeing the panel up there, I thought it was a good chance to sort of ask a question about a trial where I think almost everyone's probably involved. And the types of questions that I, that I have about this are 15% of the patients are going to be eligible, but what's going to happen with the other 85%? And the, that tissue and those data, what's going to happen with that? Also, uh, who's going to run it? Which, how is it determined and which of the groups would run it? I'm sure they all wanted a piece of it. Who's paying for it? Um, what platform is being used? We just heard about platforms. Is it a platform that the FDA will then consider a reasonable one if it does work so that this could then lead to an approval? So just a little bit of uh, a few questions about that study. I can start and Jeff, Jeff uh, Abrams can, can probably finish. So the information that I, I have, I can give you. So the, uh, you know, uh, ECOG had come up with a proposal for ALK mutants as an adjuvant and CLGB uh, for EGFR mutants. And uh, this led to a discussion with NCI. And uh, we obviously need, uh, uh, because of some of the issues I addressed earlier, we need CLIA approved labs uh, to do the ALK and the EGFR uh, mutational analyses. But they're going to be about 8,000 patients screened in order to come up with the eight, six or 800 or so that we need. And we're hoping that uh, we're going to work out a deal with the uh, Cancer Center for Genomics at the NCI to uh, do uh, the follow-on to TCGA uh, uh, using paraffin embedded tissue on these patients and get less, uh, not, not as rigorous information on the extra 8,000 that we get in the, eight, in the 800. Uh, but still get better information that was available uh, in the TCJ. But hopefully, and Monica and I really hope that uh, that we'll be able to do contemporary uh, analyses on these people so that as they relapse, we can start to choose what medicines they should get. Yeah, and I don't have much to add except that, um, you know, I think it's an example of a, of a good partnership of uh, the cooperative group or N new NCTN program uh, across the entire network trying to find these rare subgroups of uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients to do adjuvant crizotinib and adjuvant nerlotinib, but at the same time taking advantage and not losing the benefit of those 8,000 screened patients and doing the massive parallel sequencing that was talked about and other platforms, methylomes and so forth. And then having that, unfortunately, about 50% of those patients are destined to relapse. So at the time of relapse, rebiopsying, hopefully understanding the natural genomic history of those patients, so to speak, and therefore at that point having patients who could be slotted into other 
uh, trials either through the cooperative groups or through cancer centers. But you'll have the informatics right. to identify those patients at the time of relapse before you even do the rebiopsy, so they yes. could be sent for those trials? Yes, so the, the, the study is being split is actually three trials. It's a large screening trial that's run by Alliance. And Alliance has made the commitment to do the long-term outcome follow-up on all of the patients that are that are enter the study, so that all 8,000. And then the two mutation populations will be sent, one to uh, an EGFR um, trial run by Alliance and the other to the, um, the ALK, ALK fusion patients to the trial led by ecog Akron. Um, and the, because of the fact that the initial screening trial would, will be doing long-term follow-up, that will be the mechanism for identifying um, the recurrence in the entire population and being able to, you know, hopefully um, look for secondary trials. I mean, obviously, we want to leverage this as much as we possibly can and the ability to follow this cohort for a long period of time. So we are, frankly, actively looking for other investigators to engage in this um, in the use of this population. And how do you pay for that, Monica? So if someone in the community, so we, <laughs> so, so we want the community get, to get involved, and I think it's great because this is where right. the community can start to screen their patients. They don't get reimbursed 2,000 per patient just for the screening, do they? Are there sort of leveled grades of how this works? or? How well, so so we, we, are, we are still working this out. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if we can even directly answer the question as to how much the screening is going to be. You know, right now we know that we have, um, we have a, a budget that we are working on to actually do the testing itself. And so the site reimbursement, you know, I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, I can say that the, you know, the reimbursement to the sites for the long-term follow-up is going to be modest and the reimbursement to the you know, the, to the, and the overall group will take it as part of its base funding. So um, it's a considerable investment on the part of the NCI to come up with the money to actually do the testing. And then, you know, again, in the leveraged world we live in on the part of the groups to make sure that it, you know, we have the funding going forward uh, to complete the follow-up. Now, just from my personal opinion, it's exactly the type of trial that I think many hoped would come out of this type of you know, network. But we feel very, very strongly, you know, the community is a huge part of what we're here to serve. The community oncologists and the ability to do cancer clinical trials in the community. And this was exactly the kind of effort we wanted um, because, you know, we agree. These are the kind of things that patients in the community should have access to, especially something like this, where it is a long-term follow-up and screening and the ability to keep the community engaged because because of these patients is very high and I think goes beyond the benefit even that we're going to get out of the genomic information that comes from this one specific trial. Alex, so, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. so um, just to follow up on what Monica said about the importance of community, if you think of the overall NCI research budget and the fact that it's concentrated at the cancer centers, uh, but if you look at the counties and communities beyond the academic centers and where is NCI-supported research being done, the majority of it in those non-academic counties, towns, municipalities, corners of states, and even entire states is through the cooperative groups. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the CCOP program. It's the affiliate members of the groups. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, people who might participate through NCCCP. But I mean, that... You know, if you're in a corner of one of our states and people are getting care there, the main way it's supported by NCI is really through the group. So I don't think any of us could emphasize our role in our relationship to those communities as not being critical for the groups, but also for those communities. Uh, Patty Gans, UCLA. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the design of this wonderful trial, which I think from a scientific and genomic perspective is very important. But I would strongly urge, whenever we are going to do these observational trials, to get in host factors, behavior, other medications. I mean, Roy's article in JCO that I did the editorial on talking about how, you know, the costs of recruiting patients for these trials are enormous. The genomic data that you're going to have, if you can link it to either germline or, you know, exposures that the individuals with this common disease have, it's a missed opportunity. And this is where NCOR is obviously going to dovetail in here. So you're obviously launching this before NCOR gets 
going, but I think this is exactly the kind of synergy that we need to propose because when you collect blood or tumor, you have to do a questionnaire. And it, if not, we miss all of the opportunity from the cost and investment in the trial. So I hope that's something that you're doing. Absolutely part of the study design. And again, you know, uh, with the ability to use the databases we have now, it should be simpler than it has been in the past to integrate these other kinds of, of, of endpoints into the study. And who's last? Chuck, I was just going to say, and there's another model that actually kind of ties us all together, which instead of screening people for a specific trial and only putting 7% on, is you take all comers with disease, so 2,000 patients with colorectal cancer, and establish a clearinghouse, kind of like what Levi was talking about earlier today. At least three of the groups have proposed doing this, and you track everything about the patient, all their demographic data, all their treatment data, and of course you do extensive genomic analysis. And so there's several advantages. Number one, you learn more about the prognosis and the results of standard treatment in these very rare subsets of patients. And two, they are pre-screened so that if you do develop a breedograph mutant trial later on, understanding all the biases by doing this, you'll have a pre-screened set of patients to pop on. So we're pretty excited about that possibility. Uh, yeah, I have to finally throw in here, what better model? 8,000 lung cancer patients that are going to be followed for outcome to do a cancer care delivery research model as well. <laughs> you know, this is why when we heard, you know, cancer care delivery and what's that and that being rolled out and the importance of that to, to oncology going forward, which is why the groups definitely did not want to be left in the cold because there's a lot I think we have to offer to um, contribute to that, that it, you're right, is a minimal addition to something that is already very costly and time intensive. Okay, so, so with that, I, I guess I did so get the last right, word. Right, right. You have the last word. <laughs> well, I just want to thank everyone for a wonderful day. I hope to see you all back tomorrow because uh, we, do, we also have an exciting agenda. Session um, five will have commence at eight o'clock in the morning, and it is going to be the session about accelerating innovation through effective partnerships. So thank you very much.